link into uh, into the chat. And so if you prefer to watch the session on Zoom platform rather than the conference platform, you can just click the Zoom link in the chat and let us know if you have questions. All right, shall we start, Chris? Or do we want to give for a couple more minutes? We can just yeah, start. Yeah, we get started. All right. Well, thank you for all for coming to our session today at the Inclusive Science Com Symposium. And um, this is the Scientists as Civic Participants Equity Through Local Engagement session. And throughout the presentation, we also encourage, encourage you to turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. All right, just a, a quick introduction of me and Chris. We are the presenters slash facilitators for this workshop. My name is Nancy Xu, and I am a fifth year PhD student at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And my research focus is development science. I primarily work with family and kids, and you will hear a lot of examples that I'll be using today it was on early childhood. Chris? Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Chris Jackson. I, I'm a fifth year chemistry PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and in my um, work with engineers and scientists acting locally, I currently serve as our workshops director. So I work with Nancy and a variety of other scientists and engineers to kind of provide training experiences to help um, folks like all of y'all um, engage in um, science and policy at the local level. So again, thanks for joining us and hope to chat more. Okay, great. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right into the workshop then. So why do we care? And why do we want to engage locally? The central piece of information that we want to present today is to help you think in a way that's aligned with this philosophy listed here on the slide. Decisions are made by those who show up. So decisions are made by those who actually do something. And this is true for all level of government, especially at the local level. So we know that there's a lot of attention is paid to what's happening in Washington DC or even internationally. But we also want to emphasize that a lot of science policy actually takes place in local communities. And within these local communities, not only there's generally less attention, less engagement from local public, but in particularly much less engagement from scientists and engineers and people with those expertise, knowledge and backgrounds. So East so it was founded on this premise that yes, you can engage in science policy and yes, you can engage um, science policy by utilizing your trainings and skills wherever you are. And we really encourage people to do that at the local and state levels. And you're here today at this presentation, so I assume that you are interested in engaging locally. You might not know where to start. Uh, you might not have uh, the tools to help you engage effectively yet, but we are here to help you. Um, at ESOL, we have developed to showcase many variety of opportunities and provide the tools and resources to help people engage in science policy at the local levels. Um, so by now you have um, heard me said many times local government, local communities and local levels. And those phrases can have different meanings to different people. So to help you understand what exactly do I mean by locally, I want to go over this ESOL framework that we'll be using today. And when I say local government, I mean anything below the federal level. So that'd be state, county, city, or um, even lower levels. So typically, if you think about, for example, I'm in, I live in Missouri, a state government can include many different parts, such as a governor's office, which typically has some head figure of state legislature. Um, a lot wide variety of departments and agencies which function differently to support the state government. And in Missouri, on the exec executive branch of the government, we have a lot of uh, different kinds of departments. It's Department for Health, Department for Education, Department for so so, uh, Social Services, and many other departments. And additionally, we also have advisory boards and commissions and various ad hoc working groups. So that's kind of at the highest state level. If we go down one lower at the county level, 
And again, we still have departments, agencies that might work collaboratively with the state on different issues, but more regional or specialized topics might including like things, for example, um, like county commissions. Public health and mental health issues have been like really big focus in recent years. And usually there are county commissions that are focusing on these issues in different states. On the next level is um, city government. This is the one that people might be the most familiar with. Um, and again, we typically see some sort of executive office such as mayor's office, followed by an elected body, typically a city council, as well as other departments and agencies that are not focused at a even much more hyper local issues relevant to the city. And then the next level is perhaps a bit more niche. Uh, it's the neighbor neighborhood uh, level where you can see unique things. And one thing that people don't often think about is that university government is actually also a form of local government. It is classified in this category of neighborhood level. And my first local engagement experience took place in university government. If you already work at a university right now, um, this is a great place to get started because a lot of advocacy groups are formed here and a lot of working groups also collaborate with other organizations outside academia and local communities. And finally, there are like ad hoc and working groups in between all these levels, such as school districts, um, rec utility districts, and water boards. And this is just a broad sampling to give an overview of what does local government look like. I live in Missouri, so that's where my engagement examples come from. But on this slide, um, it features California because that's where ESOL was founded. Um, just in case if you wondered that, I just want to clarify before we move on to the next slide. So this is our first question for you today. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of local STEM issues? And feel free to type your answers in the chat. And I can um, read that loud. Yeah, so science standards in schools, pollution issues. Yeah, so climate and schools, there are like some big ones. Lead water pipes in homes. Mm -hmm, yeah, definitely. Noise pollutions. Yeah, so a lot of environmental science focused. Yeah, all these are really great examples. Um, thanks everyone for sharing. Do we have any more that people wanted to share? Okay, I will move on to the next slide then. Um, so it depends on your field. Some local STEM issues might look uh, more familiar than others. So for example, my background is in developmental science and I work with, work with families and kids with a primary focus on early childhood. And that makes education and health issues the most relevant to me. And in Missouri, I collaborate with Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and also Department of Health to work on issues relevant to our states. And in working with education department, I participate in their monthly stakeholder meeting and comment on things that, that I think I can help um, to focus on their preschool development grant. And in working with health department, I um, de help develop training protocols for the nutrition coordinators to implement when they work with families locally. So working on issues relevant to your field of study is one way to engage locally. Another way to do that is to, to focus on what is passionate for you personally. And this may not have anything to do with your profession. So for example, climate change, um, like um, someone posted in the chats earlier, my field of study is not directly related to climate, but let's say that I'm interested in advocating for climate action plan and I want to become actively engaged in local policy related to climate change. And um, so some, some way that I can think of how I can tie in my profession is that what climate change impact everyone. So it definitely impact on lives of families and kids, especially those living in historically underserved communities. And because 
So with climate change, food and other resources will also become more limited, which can exacerbate health disparities and put low-income families at greater risk. So in that sense, everything is connected and your professional and personal passion can align together in your local engagement. Um, so taking the first step is always the hardest because if you've never done something before then you don't know where to start and whether you can succeed so here's how ESOL can help you um, uh, i'm just gonna have all these pop up okay so all the bullet points you see on this slide is a step-by-step -step get a guidance on that specific topic, which you can explore further after today's workshop. All these resources are also posted on our website, uh, which Chris, um, I think he's already shared in the chat, um, is esl.us slash playbook. It depends on your interest and what's going on in your home state. Some topics might be more interesting than others, but there's a lot of options that you can choose from. And even besides all these bullet points that we have posted on the slides, there are like many more on our slides as, on our website as well. So I'm sure everyone can find something useful um, to use for your local state. And just briefly, you uh, may not have an idea yet about what's exactly going on in your home state. Um, but you can do a quick research about policy or initiative that's currently taking place in your local community. So for example, I'm interested in moving to Oregon after I graduate next year. And I know that Oregon legislation initiatives, um, the one that just came out this year is relevant to my work because part of it focused on early childhood mental health. And that's something that I'm trying to learn about and see whether my scientific expertise can fit into that initiative somehow. And besides doing research on your own, you can also watch a public meeting or network with the local advocacy group to learn more about what's going on in that community. And sometimes I find it much faster just to talk to people rather than doing research by myself. And plus you meet people that way and then they can give you extra resources and extra people to talk to to network. And once you have some understanding about what's going on in your local community, particularly about the topics that are relevant to your science backgrounds, you can choose to advocate for a specific issue. So in terms of advocacy, we have a few options that you can choose from, like meet with representatives and staff, support a ballot measure, write an op-ed and give public comment. I won't spend too much time walking you through this list because Chris will talk more about advocacy in just a moment. Um, and he's gonna focus on delivering public comment. So the last category is service, such as joining a board, advise an official, or even running for an office position yourself. And in a later session today, I will talk more about how to join a board or commission. Um, but for now, I will pass it to Chris and he will talk more about advocacy. Great, thanks, Nancy. And I want to kind of emphasize for um, folks as you're kind of getting involved in that we're throwing a lot of different resources at you. Um, to This is depicted as a linear path, but it's important to remember that the path kind of towards local engagement is not often linear, right? You can start at any point along this pathway, which is fine. We're going to kind of give you some examples um, from advocacy and service uh, momentarily. But I just want to encourage you to think broadly about kind of based on you know all those different types of issues we just showed in that last slide and kind of all the different pathways to get engaged to kind of hopefully you walk away from this workshop with at least an idea of how you in particular might want to get involved in your community. You wanna, and we'll offer, start by offering kind of an example of two um, scientists and engineers who did just that. So Nancy, if you wanna jump to the next slide, please. The example I wanna to talk to you all about today, and this is featured from ESAL's blog. So on our blog, one of the things we do is feature stories of engineers and scientists who are active in their local communities. Um, and who have kind of taken that first step towards local engagement. So the story I wanna tell you today comes from our blog and it specifically focuses on Captain and Mary who are two bioengineering, bioengineering um, PhD students at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Um, so in addition to kind of being great bioengineering PhD students, um, Catherine and Mary were also avid bicyclers. Um, and so they kind of had this additional component of who they are as people and kind of the ways that they interacted with their local community through that activity. And after um, two cycling deaths that occurred at a traffic stop um, right next to their campus, they became aware of this and became concerned specifically about this issue of traffic safety in their community and thought about how in particular they as um, engineers and folks who with kind of this experience and knowledge about data and kind of 
um, ways of thinking about a problem could be a part of a solution. So they attended um, kind of, you know, if you go back to that pathways, which is the first way you can kind of do your research, they attended a local city council meeting to kind of see, you know, what is the discussion? This is a big issue in our community. What is the discussion that's happening about this type of issue? Um, and kind of what they found after sitting in on a couple of city council meetings, a lot of folks were talking about it. A lot of folks were passionate about this issue. Um, but what they really weren't hearing was kind of any data or evidence or kind of um, support that could really point to any concrete um, reasons for why they should make changes kind of around this intersection. Right. So they kind of being engineers specifically um, want to think about what are the types of data that we can offer um, to help make an informed decision about the way to make this um, traffic safety much more relevant and kind of um, beneficial for our community. So what they did, they did kind of a very simple data collection experiment. They went to that intersection uh, and they gathered data specifically thinking about you know, how long is the average crosswalk time? How long should it take people to actually cross? Um, kind of what's the traffic level? So they took did this very preliminary data collection and took it and presented it at the next city council meeting um, through public comments, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next couple slides. Um, but as a result of this kind of very simple advocacy work, they were able to kind of get their voices heard and effectively advocate for um, changes in policy specifically re related to signal timings, increasing the visibility of different crosswalks at this intersection and increased amounts of signage. Um, and so this is kind of a great example of how folks with, they're not particularly experts in transportation or safety or any of that type of thing, but just two engineers who kind of were passionate and had an interest in this topic were able to kind of affect a real change. Um, and as a result, they kind of developed these relationships with their local city council member and kind of were recognized for their service and continued today to continue to advocate um, for safe transportation safety in the city of Houston. And I think that's especially important and worth mentioning because so much of, we're gonna talk about a couple more examples today and kind of specific ways you can get involved in local engagement, but so much of, about um, engaging at the local level is about building those relationships and kind of becoming kind of trusted um, advocates within your own community, which I think is something that you can't do all the time when you're thinking about advocating perhaps like for federal policy or at kind of levels that are maybe geographically distant from you. But kind of we hope you take nothing away from this, that there's a real opportunity and even a need for folks with science and engineering backgrounds like Catherine and Mary um, to engage at the local level. So with that, if you're kind of hopefully inspired, I know I'm inspired personally by this story. So if you're kind of inspired by this, we want to kind of offer you, you know, if I, you wanted to be like Catherine Mary, if you wanted to kind of engage at a local level in this way, perhaps, how could you do that? And ESL provides a lot of resources to help you take that first step and do just that, specifically through our local engagement playbook. So in the next slide, Nancy, if you want to advance it, I'm going to walk you through a couple different steps on delivering public comments. And today, um, I would first wanna kind of emphasize that there's two different ways that you can kind of think about public comments. Um, first, either through spoken public comments, which is what Catherine and Mary did, and that's what I'll focus on today, kind of orally delivering your comments at a meeting, whether it's in person or sometimes virtually these days. Um, the other way that you can deliver public comments is through written public comments. And this is typically focused um, for issues that are um, perhaps a little bit more um, technical. And so a lot of written color comments are typically asked, for example, for environmental permitting decisions. I know that's where some of the environmental issues were things that came up when we asked y'all in the chat. So if that's an area of interest to you or you happen to do research or work um, kind of in a field that has direct implications and environmental review and that type of thing, there are a lot of great opportunities and really a need um, for scientists and engineers to do that. We won't be talking about that today, though there are some resources about that on our website that I encourage you to check out. But for um, the next couple of minutes, I'm going to walk you through our playbook on delivering spoken public comments. Let me jump to the next slide. So our step-by-step -step playbook, kind of at a high level, we want to start out with what exactly do I mean when I say delivering public comments and why might you want to do that, right? So public comments are an opportunity for members of a community to provide input on a policy under consideration already, or if there's kind of an issue that you see is not being fully addressed, you can bring a new issue or this new policy idea to your government's attention. Um, so this is kind of two different ways you can think about how you can effectively use public comments to advance kind of whatever advocacy you're interested in. And ideal, some ideal outcomes, right? What, do you, what could you potentially get out of this? What are some goals? Um, we've kind of mentioned these already, but first, 
hopefully like as in Catherine and Mary's case, your views are directly incorporated into the policy process, right? You are able to affect some level of change. More broadly speaking, right? Uh, other kind of ways that your public comments could influence policy is through that relationship building piece. Um, you might have, if you're delivering public comments in like um, to a governing body, such as a city council, um, you could have one of your city council members follow up with you um, and ask you to, to provide further comments, or they think about how do you incorporate your idea, if not now, at a later time. So those are kind of some outcomes that you might imagine happening. We jump to the next slide. So as we think about Kind of with those goals in mind, that kind of framework in mind, what are the actual concrete steps that you can take when you're delivering public comments? So the first step is kind of, again, going back to doing your research, find the appropriate body for those public comments, right? I want to think about um, where um, is the most effective um, place for, what is the body that is actually addressing this issue, right? So for example, Again, going back to Catherine Mary's, in that case, it was the city council, um, but it could also be various, many of those different commissions um, or um, there's other different commissions or kind of different other governing bodies within your community that might more specifically address issues of energy, uh, transportation, water issues. All of those might have specific bodies. So it's important to kind of go through your government's website, identify what those bodies are. You can look even at their their charters or their past agendas, their meeting notes to see what are the issues they've tackled before. Um, that can be a great way to help you identify. Step two uh, would then be choosing when to deliver your comments, right? In addition to kind of thinking about where you want to advocate, thinking about when you want to advocate can be equally as important. Um, and kind of thinking about there's at a kind of on an annual scale, right? Different bodies are gonna consider different issues at different times of the year, especially if you're looking at a legislative body like your state legislature, um, where they are having different specific times of year when they are um, kind of starting new legislation and debating existing proposed legislation. Um, so that can be important. And again, this is where doing your research and checking meeting agendas, you can identify, hey, is this issue going to come up at this month's meeting? I should be there and deliver public comment to make sure this perspective is heard or, hey, I see that in the past couple of months, this issue hasn't really gotten the attention I think it deserves. I'm gonna go and deliver public comments to make sure that at least people are thinking about it and maybe it'll get incorporated into future meeting agendas. So this can be kind of one way to think about strategizing the timing of your public comments. And jump to the next. So now I'm gonna get a little bit more into the nitty gritty and the weeds and the kind of how to exactly how to do this. One thing we always recommend for folks who are interested in kind of engaging through public comments, um, even if they're oral public comments, we specifically recommend you draft your talking points or even the full remarks beforehand because scientists and engineers are not typically trained to communicate in these types of formats, um, right? The important things that you have to take under consideration are you have to be extremely concise. Um, often public comments, you're given a limited amount of time, sometimes as short as a minute. Um, you might be competing with a long list of other folks who are also delivering public comments, either on the same or different issues. Um, so it's important that you kind of be as effective as possible in order to kind of get your voice heard. One way you could think about using public comments is being prescriptive, right? If the more you can tell a policymaker who is juggling a lot of different priorities and for whom this might not be their top issue, to do something is to be very prescriptive and tell them exactly what it is you want to do. Um, not just broadly kind of outlining this is a problem, but here are the direct things that I think you could do and are within your power um, to actually impact this issue. And that can be very helpful in kind of getting very directly what you want to accomplish. Um, kind of in that tip box, right? On the flip side of that, even if you don't necessarily have a direct solution, but you just want to kind of raise an issue, that is also a very viable way to use public comments, um, right? It is equally important. And that kind of ties into this third bullet point when you're thinking about no matter what type of issue you're advocating for, no matter how technical or not it is, in these types of settings, it's extremely important to kind of recognize and explain why this issue matters to you personally. And kind of, again, all politics is local, all politics is personal. And that we have found is kind of a very effective advocacy tool as you're thinking about how to make the most impact with your public comments. So we encourage you to keep that in mind. I'm gonna to jump to the next slide. Again, on the logistical piece, bringing a printed copy of your comment, again, can be effective, especially if you're competing with a wide variety of other um, stakeholders and kind of want to make sure your voice is heard. Arriving on time and staying for the duration, again, a little bit more on the logistical side. Public comment often is the very first thing on the agenda. So especially when meetings are in person, it's important to arrive early so you have time to sign in and kind of deal with all of those logistics. Um, 
At the same time, you might have opportun additional opportunities for public comments scattered throughout the agenda based on the different agenda items. So if you're able to stay for the whole meeting and addition, even better, you know, attend some meetings beforehand so you kind of have a sense for how this body operates, um, that can even be more effective. And then finally, um, our last tip, um, again, just kind of being cognizant of who you are as a scientist or engineer and a communicator. I don't think I have to stress this point too much for a science communication audience. I'm sure all of y'all have experience thinking about these issues, um, but you're communicating to a non-scientific audience 99% of the time. And so you wanna make sure that your comments are accessible to this broad audience. And especially as you're thinking about the impact of your statements, um, it's important to kind of consider that science is gonna be one of the inputs that influences any given decision, right? So there can be other issues, whether it's politics, whether it's other stakeholders or more pressing concerns that kind of might end up dictating um, the final, any final outcome. But I encourage you to continue and persevere and remember kind of a lot of this process is about um, stakeholder engagement and particularly about building those relationships. Um, so those are hopefully some tips and hopefully kind of the step-by-step -step guide really outlines um, a way for you to kind of, if you're thinking about delivering public comments or more broadly engaging with your local community. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy um, as we talk about, right, the first step, delivering public comments. As we mentioned, many folks find local engagement um, through one of these pathways and get more and more involved. And the one way you can do that is specifically through serving on a board or commission, uh, which can be a great way to have a long-term impact in your community. So I'll turn it back over to Nancy for that. All right, thanks, Chris. I know that Chris just threw like a bunch of information at you about this is what to do about delivering public comments. And then now just like go do it. And that's like a lot of information. And I am about to throw like another, just a bunch of information at you guys again about serving on boards and commissions. But hopefully uh, we also built in some discussions activities. So hopefully that will um, help you digest and also give you a chance to utilize what we just talked about. Um, so serving on boards and commissions. Um, this is one way to do local in engagement. It's not the only way, but it's also a good way to use your science knowledge, um, which is often not available for policymakers. So what does it look like? Your goal is to provide um, input and advice to your city, county, or state government about an area that you're familiar with. And maybe even you, you might even have expertise knowledge on it. And your role as an advisor is to provide service on a formal and standing body. So doing so, you are lending your expertise to important uh, decision-making in policy. And most of board and commission members do not have a PhD degree. Therefore, your expertise and knowledge are very crucial to that board. Um, but of course, you should be an honest science policy book broker. So remain as neutral as possible during the policy making is also very important. And there are multiple benefits associated with serving on boards and commissions. Throughout your service, you can develop a deeper understanding about your community and its values. You can also learn what's important for you and your com com uh, community and dedicate your time and energy to work on a collaborative goal. And during your service, it's also a great opportunity to establish relationship with government officials and elected representatives. And this is something that um, Chris has already emphasized when he was presenting earlier today. It's about relationship building. And so much about so much of local engagement is really about, about relationship building. If you're good with um, making human contact, building relationships, you're probably really excelling at uh, local engagement. And ideally, we want to have a cooperative and bilateral relationship with these officials and representatives, even though um, sometimes officials and representatives may not have the same values or say, same views as us, um, but we have expertise in science and they have expertise in policy making. So rather than telling them what to do based on our data, a working alliance can be created by meeting where they are in the policy making process. And through these relationships, we can gain practical knowledge of how our government works and um, complex range of issues that can inform decisions. So as a PhD student, I have like a lot of content knowledge uh, because that's what I'm trained for. But often what I found myself lack is process knowledge. I don't know how how government works or how things work to behind the scene. So serving on board and commissions can build relationships, um, that's for sure. But also it can also help me to quickly gain the process knowledge that I'm lacking. Okay. 
So let me walk you guys through a case study to illustrate. Uh, so Ashton Powell has a PhD in neurobiology. And during his PhD training, he got interested in translational science. So after graduation, he went to Washington DC as a Mazayan Science and Technology Fellow, where he worked on the Committee on Science, Technology, and Law. After his fellowship, he taught students with a focus on science and math at a local high school in North Carolina. While working at a local high school, Ashton was elected faculty senate president of the school, which allowed him to be appointed to the UNC faculty assembly. And this gave him the opportunity to work with the college faculty about students' transitioning issues, particularly about student mental health issues. And specifically, he built relationships with university administrators, faculties, staff members, and students. And serving on the faculty assembly, he mobilized the agenda of improved relationship building through shared governance among administrators, faculty, and students. So currently, Ashton is a member of the Ch um, Chapel Hill Board of Education, where he uh, his priorities are shared governance. Uh, shared government, mental health, and equity. And during an interview with us, um, Ashton shared his perspectives on how COVID has drastically exacerbated educational inequalities in his communities. So students at private school have much better resources to cope with remote learning, but students at public school are falling behind, especially for those students from low-income communities that who can't afford high-speed and reliable internet access home. So this is just one aspect of social economical inequality triggered by the pandemic. And one goal that Ashton has is to address these educational inequalities and to allocate resources to support public school. So now that brings our um, activity today. So let's look at this case study about Minnesota elementary school and just some background information. Um, an independent school district is proposing the construction of a new elementary school in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So to ease overcrowding in the district, uh, to, in order to construct the new school, approximately 6.22 acres of land within the Grand Rapids sports complex will need to be converted from parkland. And the area to be converted includes a parking lot, soccer field, playground, and open space. The loss of parkland would be offset by the purchase of a 1.4 acre private park located within Grand Rapids. And just assume if you live here, what questions would you ask? And what concerns would you want to raise? So I will give you guys some time to think about this case study. And when you want to share with us about your questions or concerns that you might want to raise, assuming if you live here, you can just type your answers in the chat. If you're kind of still thinking through this and trying to think about what types of issues you might want to raise, perhaps another way of kind of contextualizing it is if you, the way these things are typically proposed, so say you're a community member living in this um, Minnesota community area and you receive a kind of notice about this um, happening, or you kind of read about it in your local news, which is the way these things typically come up and perhaps your city council or another body is kind of going to be addressing this permit application, or whatever the permitting body might be, by the upcoming meeting. So if you're thinking about that as kind of as a community member, what are the issues that are important to you, particularly around kind of the availability of having this elementary school or perhaps the availability of having um, recreational space and kind of 
what were some of the, as you, this body kind of deliberates whether or not to approve this permit. What are some of the issues that you think should, this body should be considering? What might are the type of issues you might want to raise if you were to deliver public comment? Um, what are the type of issues that you think are important for your local um, governing body to consider as they think about approving or not approving this new elementary school? Or if you would just have like open questions about what exactly this process looks like, um, that's also kind of a valid thing where you could use advocacy to kind of ask those questions and make sure they're raised. So how does the new park, um, the one that they plan to purchase compared to this land that the school will be built on? Is it a true exchange? Yeah, that's a great question. A concern would be that the loss of green spaces in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what were the criteria used to select the site? And will there still be enough park space for the community? Will the park become crowded because the space is lost for the new school. Yes, exactly. So who gains and who lost? And I'd want to know if other suitable properties have been considered for the school rather than utilizing the park space. Yeah, all these are really great questions. I'm glad you guys participate and actively thinking. Do we have any more comments coming in? Okay, what other options are there other than building a new school? Mm -hmm. Like for example, hiring more new teachers, like maybe that's really the issue, right? Where maybe lack of staff rather than actual space. As you're kind of brainstorming to get folks thinking maybe in a different direction. Um, there are a lot of other infrastructure that is associated with building a new school. So you might also consider thinking about if we are building another school, what does that mean for all the other types of infrastructure that are coming up? So if you think about along those lines, that might raise some more questions as well. Yeah, and Erica just shared that if this is the first time the public hearing about this, why wasn't there a community engagement previously? All right, I will move on to the next slides, which provide um, some bullet points of some of the things that you guys already talked about. For example, this one, the third bullet point, is the new school really needed? Um, could students start at different times or expand the old schools, aka hiring more teachers, right? Um, some schools, they do have this rotation program and that can be able to accommodate a wider uh, population of students rather than building an entire new school? And uh, would it be harder for some children to get to school? And the 1.4 acres of private park is offered in exchange and who benefits from it and who um, actually doesn't, who sees negative impacts. Um, every single policy decision, there is always someone who benefit and then there is always, there's always pros and cons. And what about fi financing of a school? Like building a new school, it can cost a lot of money. Like, where does the money come from? Like, is it going to come from property tax? Then that surely involves the uh, people who live in that community. And then demographic trends about the teachers and students, and families, like people who will be attending all these, um, uh, this new elementary school, uh, assuming if it is going to be built. So yeah, all those are really great points. Um, thank you for everyone who shared your thoughts with us um, during this activity. I'll add on one more point too, as you're kind of thinking about this and you'll notice in at least some of the bullet points that we've provided here, that there are a lot of their considerations here are around equity. And I really wanna emphasize as you're thinking about the types of people who deliver public comments, the people who are able to serve on boards and commissions, there's a certain amount of privilege and kind of opportunity that those types of positions are available to folks. And of course we here at ESL are advocating for more scientists and engineers and all of y'all to get involved in that way. But it's, I think it's important to recognize that you can kind of use your advocacy uh, and kind of the perspectives 
that you bring to this discussion to think about who is involved and who is not included in these types of discussions. For example, if we're replacing a park, who previously used that park, who now has does not have access to green space? Who does the school previously serve if a new school is built that is perhaps, you know, fancier or newer? What are the types of students that are going to migrate to that new school versus students that are at a less resourced older school and could we perhaps just redirect resources to that old school instead? So all of these are questions that not only have community impact, but not only have technical and environmental considerations, but also have a lot of issues of inclusivity and equity involved um, that a lot of y'all have addressed kind of in your comments. And I think it's important to just point that out as well.